All right. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Not too tired? Great. If you so choose, please, those who want to, move forward a bit so that it be a bit more intimate in terms of the conversation. If you want to, you can move forward. I'm not compelling you to do so, but it might be good for our panelists to look at you in the eyes, to look you in the eyes. And Great. Well, listen, time is short. I'll start. Please be seated. Welcome Hello. to this panel. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you uh, among us this morning. Uh, just a quick reminder, if you want a simultaneous translation, it is available uh, at the back. Uh, don't uh, feel free to uh, get your headsets if needed. Alors, so, this morning, for our Right Fier panel, dynamic communities focusing on youth retention, linguistic security, identity building, education. This has a real impact on the wellness of young people and their capacity to fulfill their full potential in their municipality and also in their language. This round table brings together young people who manage to work in French in three different distinct contexts to talk about what makes them very proud, right fier. I'm José Anthony, talk to you about my bio. I work with the, the Youth French Canadian Federation in Canada. We're in Ottawa. We have 46 years. This federation was created 46 years ago, and it was created here in Moncton in 1974, and it was within the Canadian Association of Education in French. The fact that everything that's networking, everything to do with coming together bores fruit. It's when we come together that we can work together and also to dream together. And our federation came from this type of meeting in 1974. So wonderful things have been done since then. So I'll take a few moments to introduce you our federation, our French-speaking youth federation. We're a small network of young people who represent people from 14 to 25 years of age, from one coast to the next, under our chair, which you met this morning, whom you met this morning, rather, explaining to you that we work with young people who speak French. Very inclusive, very open. May you speak French as your mother tongue or a second language, third language or other. If you speak French, you're welcome to our federation. And we speak on your behalf and you're involved in many, activi many activities. So our federation was created 46 years ago. And since then, we've seen young people graduate and go to other positions uh, and functions within our communities. And it's always an interesting exercise to go through you know, a, a room and who participated in our federation activities in the past. So who has participated in activities of one of our 11 members representing nine provinces and two territories throughout the country? And that's always am amusing to see that our youth network has quite an impact. We work in a network just like you, and it's very important. This is the strength of our federation. We work on bringing young people together to put an, uh, to end isolation between francophones who often live in minority settings. It's important that francophones can see each other, meet each other, exchange, and dream together. When we're isolated in northern Ontario, for instance, or in the territories, again, regardless, a small village or a small community, if we can't see other young people who are like us, it's difficult to imagine a future. We said that we lived in a difficult uh, climate for francophones, it's difficult to bring young people to be proud of their language and defend their language and to speak it. So we'll talk about these types of issues this morning. And our federation has three main events, the Francophonie Games, bringing together 1,200 young people over three years under the leadership, arts and sports. The last uh, games were in Moncton Dieppe in 2017. The youth forum 
these are important events that bring young people from coast to coast together. And we work on main issues, social innovation, linguistic security. We talked about this a bit this morning. We'll continue voting at 16, modernizing the Official Languages Act. These are all issues that are important to our young people. These issues will guarantee them a good future and allow them to live in French within their community. All this in closing, in a philosophy for and by young people. Perhaps you've heard this, by and for. What does it mean for us? It means to get the young people involved from the beginning in a project, with an initiative, and that these young people be at the table. I often say as a director of the Federation, my role, I'm, I'm my team and I are the tools and the young people are the mind they imagine, they dream, they develop a strategic plan. And it's the team that has the responsibility of implementing that plan. So it's young people who tell us what they need, their wishes, their aspirations, and we're a vehicle to help them realize their great aspiration. That's why they're very committed, engaged in the Francophonie, in their personal paths. So we'll have wonderful examples of by and for young people this morning. So I'll stop here. If you want to learn more regarding our federation, it's our federation. We have lots of information. We have a website, and it'll be a pleasure for me to talk about this later on. So I'll close on this, and I'll introduce you to our panelist, Yasa Alassabi. Yasa is 19. He's from Syria. He arrived in Canada in 2016 at, because of the war in Syria. In, at the age of 16, he enrolled in uh, English high school until graduation. <clears throat> About a year before he graduated, he realized that his best option would be to study at the University of Moncton. So he began to teach himself French with the help of the internet and by attending events in French to give so that he could study at this French language university. Not only was he accepted, but he also won the prestigious Romeo Leblanc Scholarship awarded to an English-speaking student in Atlantic Canada based on academic merit. Many days afterwards, the minister, Melanie Joly, invited him as a dignitary to celebrate the Canada Day in Ottawa. He finished his first year at the University of Moncton last April. So, yes, sir. Our second guest... from the University of Quebec in Montreal. Sandrille has 11 years in experience in client services and management. In 2016, she left Quebec to move to Calgary, where she obtained a communication internship within the Alberta Economic Development Council. She was promoted to the Economic Development Advisor, working primarily in tourism and philanthropy. Sandrine is also the voice behind several commercials recorded in French in Calgary. In 2018, she received an excellence award at the Gala de la Francophonie of the, Associ of the Association Canadienne Française de l'Alberta. Ambitious in nature, she will begin a certificate in leadership development from Mount Royal University in the fall. Sandrine. Will McGrew. Will McGrew, founder and CEO of Télé Louisiane. He's a franco louisianian of 24 years old who fights to promote the French language, economic development, energy, and social inclusion in his home state. Born in New Orleans, he spent most of his childhood in Louisiana. He spent a year in Morocco on a grant from the U.S. State Department uh, to learn Arabic and apply his French. He studied economics and political science at Yale University, where he wrote his thesis on the relationship between economic growth and ethno-linguistic diversity. He now works with a group of Franco-Louisianian film professionals and uses his economic and linguistic expertise to develop Télé Louisiane as the first audiovisual channel in French-speaking Louisiana. Well, So, this is how it'll work. I'll let our guest talk to you for a few moments, for a few moments, and then we'll 
then you will be able to ask questions to our panelists. All this in 53 minutes and 30 seconds, all right? All right. Do so you have a microphone? Yes, sir. So do you want to start? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. We'll talk to us about his ex life experiences. Go ahead. I think it's working. Good morning. How are you? All right. So I'm Yasser Yasmin. I come from Syria. And I came to Canada in 2016 because of the war in Syria. And when I arrived in Canada, <coughs> there wasn't much time to think what should I be doing. Our only focus was to survive. At the beginning, I registered at the high school in Moncton, an English-speaking high school here in Moncton, and it's because I knew a little bit of English. But before I finished high school, a year before university, I had to decide what to do after high school. And it's a decision which is difficult for all young people. But I realized that there's a university here in Moncton. And honestly, I didn't think it was an option for me when I arrived in Canada. But after living here, for two and a half years, well now it's been three and a half years, but at the time, I thought, why not? I could learn French here. My idea is that if there's internet and a computer, everything is possible with the internet and a computer. That's what I use. I use internet to learn French. Well, there are hundreds of hundreds of channels of websites and hundreds of channels on YouTube. So I learned French on the net and I attended some events here in Moncton with uh, French speaking organizations. And I tried. I applied to University of Moncton and I was accepted. But that's not it. I received a call from University of Moncton and I was told that I won the Excellence Award Roméo Leblanc. That award, I didn't quite understand how important that award was because that award, that bursary is given to only one Anglophone in Atlantic Canada who has the highest marks in Atlantic Canada in English-speaking schools. And this covers all tuition, university tuition. So I was very pleased it pays for tuition, but also my situation was that now I can stay in Moncton and study. But the idea to stay in Moncton was important uh, to me because, because I didn't want, I didn't want to move. And you know, It's complicated to move, eh? But after, after I obtained the Romeo Leblanc bursary, I was invited by the Minister from Heritage to, be, uh, to attend Canada as a dignitary for Canada Day in Ottawa. And it was quite a surprise for me. And yes, it's my choice, that's why I'm here. And now I finished my first year at the University of Moncton in a pre-med program. It's called Health Science Degree, yes. It's a very focused, it's a program focused on, or prepara in preparation for, for medicine. So that's it. Thank you. 
Yes, sir. Before we move to our next uh, guest, why did you decide to study in French? Well, when I arrived in Canada, the process in my mind was very simple. I had to learn both official languages in Canada, but at the beginning, I took this in strides, I took it slowly. I couldn't learn both of them at the same time. I could study in English first in high school, but when I found that there was a university in Moncton, it was logical. I live in Moncton, there is a university in Moncton, so I'll study in Moncton. And to learn French is not more difficult than moving and, and pay for this and that and live uh, by myself. So it was an opportunity for me to study in Moncton, to stay in my family and stay in Moncton, which is my new home, because now I lost my home country. But to be able to study in French in Moncton, I can improve my French directly, very quickly. So that was a logical decision. Yeah, it's very simple, very logical, right? Okay. But we often hear from what you're saying, yes, that is the importance to have French-speaking institutions within our communities. That's what allows us to retain our young people. And the fact that Yasser had this idea, oh, let's learn French and study in French, will make it so that eventually Moncton will have another bilingual doctor. So we'll have access to those services in the future. And these ties with your family, Yasser's family is here. Hello, family. <laughs> All this requires community support, family support, but it's even bigger than that. This is how we build communities. Thank you, yes, sir. So, Will, talk to us a bit in five to seven minutes about your life experiences. All right, okay. Thank you very much for welcoming me here. I'm Louis. I come from Louisiana. I'm a Franco Louis from Louisiana. Maybe you heard something else, but we do exist. There are thousands of Francophones in Louisiana to this day. Don't speak to us in English. You can speak to us in French, we'll understand, but I'm not judging anyone because myself, I didn't know when I was very young that there were for Francophones in Louisiana. There was lots of them because there's a really a problem of, of, of mindset. I can explain my past and explain to you the situation in Louisiana. So, I was born in New Orleans. Uh, my father was an Anglophone coming from Florida, and my mom is from Louisiana. She speaks French and Spanish. So it's because my grandmother was from Spain. Well, my grand and my mom spoke French. And at the time, I thought, oh, it's because, well, we're in a more cosmopolitan family. My grandmother was an immigrant, so that's why she could speak French. But more and more, I realized that, no, yes, she learned French originally when she lived in Spain, but she left Spain when she was in high school because of the Civil War in Spain. So it was really in America, in Louisiana, where she practiced French the most. Well, my grandfather was a lawyer, but he was an Anglophone but he had a lot of French-speaking clients throughout the state. So she was doing translation for him, and she was uh, teaching French, and also she was part of a few Franco associations. And at the time, I was aware of all this, but I thought it was rather, you know, groups, uh, you know, that exists uh, throughout America, but groups that are dealing with French culture. But later, I realized that, in fact, these are Franco Louisian, Louisianan, and you know, these groups existed since the beginning of colonization. So, yes, I was aware of this. I knew, of course, Louisiana existed. There was a culture of Louisiana before the creation of the United States, before Americans arrived. So, it's not a question of immigrants 
in Louisiana. It's a question of what is Louisiana. Louisiana was always, since its beginning, as as a French-speaking territory. Well, at university, I studied economy, economic development, more particularly. We're focusing on ethno-linguistic diversity in nations where you have a regional language and a national language. And I realized that really there's a lot of similarities between Louisiana and Quebec. We could say that 40 years ago there were a lot of things similar between Louisiana and Quebec and Catalonia and uh, Basque Country and Acadia, etc. But what happened is that I studied, I said, okay, in Quebec we have Télé Quebec, we have French schools. There's bilingual signage. There's all these policies and public policies and laws that we preserved the French language. And I know there's a situation that here is different in Acadia, but there were a lot of efforts being deployed. So I realized that before, yes, there's always a lot of French speakers. And I realized it's not just my mom and my grandmother. I had friends in school in New Orleans who grew up. And yeah, it's true, there's a lot of Anglophones there, but there's also thousands of French speakers in Louisiana. Again, I repeat myself, and maybe if you go in Louisiana and you'll say, oh, everyone's speaking into you in English, that's the case. But you can send us a message on social network and we can tell you where you have to go to speak with Francophones, not just in New Orleans, but throughout Louisiana. So, so I think it shows the fact that there's some people that come to Louisiana and say, yeah, everyone is speaking to me. And in fact, the problem is not not people's problem. It's it's not a question of will. In fact, people in Louisiana are really different from other Americans. Yes, we're Americans. We're proud to be Americans. But you go to Louisiana and you'll see more flags of New Orleans, more flags of Acadia or Louisiana itself than American flags because we're proud of this. We're proud of this legacy. And I realize that there is a people in Louisiana, we couldn't say there's almost a Louisiana nation, a culture. There's a people that has a different culture. And what's sad, because of two things, we haven't changed the mindset and we didn't develop infrastructure like you have done here in French-speaking Canada. But there's still this people, there's still this identity. And I would even say I learned and I studied for the Basque country, they use the term or the idea that people who speak fluently the national language or the popular language, the regional language, they are the very, at the very heart of the nation. But there's other people that speak French and Cajun French and Creole Louisiana, which is a language that exists in Louisiana, and even those who don't speak at all French. But all these people they belong to that people, to that culture, we could say to that nation. And I would say, you know, I wouldn't say the majority want to learn French, but the majority want to protect and develop our culture, our people, and French is fundamental to all this. I have a friend who studied in immersion school and says, without French, Louisiana is like any other state. For us, it would be a catastrophe. So that's why we want Tele Louisiana. Of course, it's 50 years too late because maybe you don't know this, but in 1970, there were more than a million Francophones in Louisiana. So my mom was at the time, at that time, she was alive. And it's very recent, you know. There is this identity that's very dear. So we notice that even today, it's not too late to create this ecosystem and change mindsets. So we have this television channel as the first digital platform in French, and we create content using Creole, Creole. We want to create more content, audiovisual content in French so we can live in that language. But then our goal is to change mindsets. We want 
to have a quiet revolution in Louisiana. And that's what's starting to happen because there were efforts in the past in Louisiana to pr protect the French language. There were a lot of pioneers like Etrasbicher, Joseph Tank, Amalanda Lafleur, there are many names like this, but the problem was that we always remained in our corner, in our small corner, but what we want to do is to say, all right, French was always a language in Louisiana. Of course, we speak English and we speak other languages, but the language that's in our blood, I don't mean this, Jim, biologically, but I mean culturally and emotional. It's part of, of our food. You'll see this in the foods, uh, in the music, in the schools everywhere, in literature. It's all in French. So that's our goal. We've, we're, our group was created a year ago, but already we see there's a lot of uh, requests. We're a small team of, what, 15 people working at our channel, but people write to us throughout Louisiana and also throughout what I call the greater Louisiana people who left Louisiana maybe for economic reasons or environmental reasons, Katrina, for instance, but also Hurricane uh, Katrina, but also linguistic reason. They live in Acadia because they want to live in French, but there are not many opportunities to do so. And this population received a lot of messages from Francophones uh, in Canada and people from France and everyone. We've noticed. We need this. People need this. And Louisiana also needs it. So we have a lot of hope. In a year or so, we will launch our web application and our mobile application. But right now, you can find the whole content in French of all ages who speak in French on our, on our YouTube page. So thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Merci beaucoup, Will. Um, beaucoup de choses que tu... uh, Many things you have said resonates with you, the reality of youth here in Canada. You talked about the fact that francophonie or the French language is what makes you, your state, unique. And this is what distinguishes a lot of our communities also, this privilege of being able to speak another language. It's a great advantage. You talked about economy, yes, but even just culturally to represent the uh, cultural heritage of a people, that's very important. You mentioned also the importance of public policies to support the development of language. Without those public policies, it's much more difficult. So it's a, a role that we all contribute, can contribute to, to the development of public policies in that sense. Another thing that also uh, struck me was, and you mentioned it a couple of times, that there are thousands of francophones in Louisiana. You mentioned it often. I think we shouldn't fear going to the uh, to search our francophone communities because there's so many similarities. Uh, you work in uh, for a media, yes. So the importance of being able to hear oneself, to see oneself, but to hear our accents. So it's great that you can put forward this language, your language, your French, which is uh, different, but as important as all the other French languages. Uh, also here, the media, we have them, the community that, uh, in the communities, the media that we find from um, one coast to the other, uh, our accents, the way we speak, that's the wealth or the richness of our language. So thank you very much for this. Now, Sandrine, up to you. Hi, Sandrine. I'm originally from Quebec, but I've been living in uh, Calgary in Alberta, Canada for the last four years. I'm counselor in the Economic uh, Council. Um, I work there. So what we do there, for those who are not so familiar, our mission is to develop a, an innovative, engaged uh, economic force in Alberta. Uh, more specifically, I work for tourism. It's been mentioned. It's a uh, 
important tool and uh, the Alberta in the different francophone uh, places, uh, Europe, across the world, uh, everywhere, we basically promote we uh, the uh, offer of French language for uh, tourism businesses. Uh, so it's a distinct value. We want uh, people to come see us to uh, have a life experience in French. So yes, we have our landscapes, but we also have the people who give strength to these communities. When I chose to work in uh, public relations in Montreal, I was looking for a position of ambassador or of spokesper spokesperson. I like being with people. I like to, know, to talk uh, on behalf of causes in which I believe. Uh, fortunately, I worked in Francophonie in Alberta, so it's a little bit as if uh, my interests and my principles, basically who I am, and my interest, what I want to, what I want to do is to meet people. That's at the crossroads. So, I have the impression I can basically shine in this type of uh, position. Actually, my relationist uh, relations aspect uh, uh, makes that I meet all the multicultural uh, communities, the uh, Aboriginal, Métis, Inuit. So, when I meet all these people from different origins, I believe, basically. I have a, it's, it's, it's not an offensive type of uh, approach, but I want to talk about the real topics, the strengths of each and every one of us, how we can support one ourselves, ourselves uh, culturally, humanly, because all that is part of one aspect. And that's what I really like in Alberta. Though, okay, what we do in uh, Tourism Alberta, we have a website, we have a tourism guide in French every year. That's our main tool. We have uh, social media communi communication 360 degrees. We have ambassadors. We want, we like to work with people locally, basically putting a face on the destination. So that's the work that we do. We're a very small team. But uh, basically, it's the reality of uh, all uh, francophonie. I mean, we're called upon to do much with very little. Uh, we have different uh, realities, but it's our responsibility to well represent this uh, uh, minority, but in a majority type of setting. So I really appreciate uh, meetings. Uh, I mean, Will and I are part with the mobilizing youth. Uh, so it's a fantastic opportunity to connect with uh, everyone in all the Americas. So that's it, and I find it absolutely great being here today. Thank you, Sandri. You touch on certain important aspects, the added value of uh, francophonie, uh, business-wise, but also economic-wise. Uh, we say often that uh, francophonie is, is expensive. I mean, it's something that is heard. It's a comment that is heard often. So it's good for you to be able to show that there are economic advantages to francophonie. It's uh, not an expense. So when public policies have to be developed, it's something to think of. Uh, it's also an opportunity for young youth. Uh, Sandrine had the opportunity to go west to find out about a new community, and four years later she's still there. Uh, it's also a question of uh, working with the people locally, and it shows how youth uh, work these days in a general way, to work together to make a difference. This is what this generation wants to do, wants to contribute to. Unfortunately, there's not always the opportunities to do that. We forget sometimes that youth have something to contribute today. So I have a couple of questions for you, and then we'll feel some questions from the uh, hall. Living in French is a, a choice that uh, you have to make, that I have to make on a daily basis. It's, it's a choice that we have to remind ourselves of daily. Yes, I continue in French because the opportunities sometimes are easier at different places of the country. So why did you choose this and why do you continue with this choice to live in French in your community or municipalities? So all three of you, short answers from each one of you. In fact, it was mentioned, it's a question of identity. To live, 
I realized uh, with the years, and you mentioned it, Jose, we choose to continue to live in French because it's very easy to choose the majority, for example, in Alberta specifically. So we choose to continue to live in French to basically make sure that our potential, full potential, is used. Uh, I mean, it's been shown that uh, uh, according, depending on the language that we speak, we speak, we see things differently. So we're basically, with two languages, adding something, and it's a multivision. So yes, it's an asset. It's a complementary uh, languages, basically. Yeah, in fact, it's important to, to live in French. In Louisiana, it could be very difficult. In New Orleans, especially, if I lived in Villeplate or Mamour, in those villages, basically, are more francophone. It would be possible. But anyway, I try to do it when I can. If I have a friend or there's my mother, I try to speak French to her. So, yes, it's important to do that because we have to show that uh, the French language is uh, alive, uh, it has, uh, uh, it's useful. Uh, something important also is that the French language has to continue to live. Uh, it's important for us. It's uh, like you said, institutions are very important. And for us, it's not just a question, for example, it could be the case of Quebec, for example, Montreal, you could say, yes, we have institutions. Well, this is what we need, and now it's up to the individuals to choose properly uh, to speak French. So, yes, it does exist. We need to do that. But it's also a question of creating uh, institutions and an environment so that uh, it become more easy to speak uh, French in Louisiana. And that doesn't exist yet, unfortunately. So I think that for our generation as a franco louisianians that's basically our perspective. Not just to speak French with our grandparents or to speak French or to sing French. We do that, yes. But it's also, even if we have to speak English with uh, uh, different areas, uh, it's a question of uh, convincing them that it's uh, important and it's worthwhile to create an environment in French so that my children will have it easier to speak French in the future. So for me, I'm not uh, a francophone by birth, but living in French was a, a choice that I made. When I was a student at the university, it was really living in French because I go to the university, I'm with the university or in the university more often than I'm with my family. So. Uh, but the reason I wanted to learn French was not just to go to the university. Like I said, I lost my country, birth country. Canada is now my country, and I have to speak the language of my country, and that is English and French. So I have to learn English and French. And that's how I decided that uh, I had to very clearly learn French, but now the fact that I'm at the University of Moncton, things have become more simple because I was forced to learn French as quickly as I could. And living in French basically has changed my life. I could now stay in Moncton and that is something that is very dear to me. Thank you to Moncton, thanks to uh, my friends, uh, the people who have uh, supported me when I came here, especially with my family. So for all these reasons, I'm really happy, proud, and ready to live in French on a daily basis. What you're saying is really very important, and it's an inspiration. It, it, it kind of makes us understand the importance that the youth uh, consider in the fact that they live in French. Uh, and 
it's something that we have to realize that um, uh, the youth have to leave to continue to be able to live in French. There are very few post-secondary institutions uh, across the country, uh, and if they do exist, is the program is not in French, so uh, youth don't have any other opportunity than to leave their environment to continue to live in French. So I think that when the youth have these resources for these institutions to develop, to help them in their development, that contributes to the development of youth in our communities. I come back to the idea of investing oneself in an institution. So we invest in the youth and we invest in the vitality of Francophone communities across the Americas. I'm going to ask two more questions and then we'll go to the public. First of all, the notion of uh, uh, linguistic security or the phenomenon of in linguistic insecurity. So uh, very quickly, an overview. Uh, it's not a uh, specific phenom phenomenon to youth. Uh, I mean, adults, we live through uh, linguistic insecurity. There are opportunities when we believe that our French is not good enough to use it in a professional context or even personal context or even in a social context to say that oh, my French is not at the proper level I mean because we don't want to be judged we want to, don't want to be corrected my maybe you know my mother tongue is not good enough to use it this is a something that the youth live through it and not the so this not so young also uh, uh, maybe I want to hear what you have to say as to how to go beyond this. Do you, have you lived this? How do you live it in your community? And how do you go beyond this? Uh, actually, right now we are developing a, a linguistic uh, strategy that is important for us. Uh, so do you live uh, linguistic insecurity and how do the youth uh, go beyond this? I would say that, yes, it's uh, noticeable. We talked about the notion of a choice with Madame Duguay, and linguistic insecurity is having the choice of uh, speaking one's own language without being judged. Uh, and, okay, in Alberta, I've seen people accept the positions in English, even if Basically, they would have wanted to have a uh, French position, but it's a, a false choice. We, cho we choose an Anglophone position by default. Uh, it's maybe too competitive in uh, other developments, in areas that would be enriching for personally. There are people who feel that uh, they're not as comfortable speaking one language or another. For example, in French, they're not comfortable speaking French. So that will prevent them from uh, having uh, connections with other people that may bring them farther. So it's a question of absence of choice or a false choice. That's a form of uh, linguistic insecurity. Yes, I believe that uh, especially when I'm away from Louisiana, because, yes, I learned French when I was fairly small, but it's not my uh, first language, so I'm with people from Quebec or Franco-Canadians, I'm intimidated a bit. But I think I've gone beyond that, uh, because uh, if I stay at that point, then we're not going to have a French in Louisiana, and it would be too much work. But it's interesting that... Uh, uh, you mentioned this, uh, the youth, because in Louisiana, it's maybe the other way around. Uh, there was a fairly big campaign, a simulation, a simulation against Francophones that started at the beginning of the 20th century, and that lasted till the uh, 50s, 60s. But that stopped in the 60s. Uh, things got better, but the problem is that the uh, injury uh, remained uh, because we did not develop uh, an infrastructure that uh, could have helped to change the mentality. So I think basically we have to uh, address this uh, uh, linguistic insecurity for youth, but it's more so a problem with the older people who speak Louisiana French perfectly. They're basically the uh, French speakers, but they have this shame that they've learned at school that it's not good to speak French. And you don't even speak French properly. But I think it's changing. 
uh, a little bit of a shout out. For example, Arnoville, it's one of the uh, uh, most francophone villages in Louisiana. You have to visit it. There are uh, somebody that's called Georges Marx, who's uh, uh, responsible for a collective. His mother speaks Louisiana French perfectly. He says before that, she didn't speak, but now we have the collective. So there, there are people the mayor of Paris, the consul from France, representatives from Quebec, who, Acadians, yes, they were there when I was there in April. And now I was speaking with him on a partnership, and I heard his mother speak French with uh, a friend. And it was really incredible, because it's not frequent to, to hear French uh, natural like this in Louisiana, but it shows that if we value French, people will be saying, yes, I am proud to be a Franco-Louisianian, and it's not something out of the folklore only. Linguistic insecurity is something that uh, is comes from the fact that we hesitate in speaking. So I've lived through that uh, in three different languages at three different times. But what I find is that it takes courage. Most of the time, for them, for people, it's not important how you say people. It's what you say that is important. And to speak the language, one has to have the courage, be confident, and it's necessary to understand that uh, uh, language is not just words one after the other. It's a culture, it's a tradition, it's, there's culture, there's uh, music. It's a whole world on its own. So when one understands that this language and my identity, it's all this is one world in itself will be able to speak with confidence and especially for me when I want to speak a language in which I don't feel I'm really correct basically what's important is what I say it's also important to have the will to improve. That's very important. Because when we have the will to improve, when we'll get better with time, we'll be more confident. So the courage when we start, and then afterwards, just let it happen. I think, okay, to improve one's own linguistic security, there's a lot of work to do. But as a society, we also have work to do to be more open, to open ourselves to people who wish to speak French, uh, to listen to them without wanting to correct them. Although there, There's context for learning, yes, yes, what we say at the Federation, it's important language classes, it's important to learn language, the different levels of French. But in a social context, we have to jump on opportunities to speak. It's by using the language that we improve. So the last question before we open it to the public, knowing the people that we have in the room, when we talk about uh, citizenship, citizen engagement or participation, what do we do to engage our youth in our municipalities and our communities? So. Let's, uh, if you could give us some concrete examples, uh, are there any programs or examples of projects or initiatives that uh, show that uh, youth want to stay at home? Generally speaking, three words, dialogue, first of all, consultation, sit with the youth, ask their opinion, uh, clearly that's at the basis. Then there's also confidence uh, in oneself and uh, confident that uh, change is good, to permit change. It's easy also to lock horns with our own pro uh, situations. I think we all do this at one point or another. And then afterwards, decision. Uh, give them the, the power to decide to the youth, uh, obviously. I haven't been in the work uh, uh, sphere for 
years, but we have tasks that were given. So yes, we have to start somewhere. We have to improve, but uh, uh, there are situations where there's uh, objectivity and a new way of looking at things. Yes, we're coming out of schools. You don't have the same experience, but at the same time, we're like a, a white canvas. Uh, we paint a little bit with all the different colors. There's no limit. So the question of the dream and all that, that's very important. Concretely speaking, maybe uh, uh, access to jobs uh, for uh, youth. Uh, I benefited from that type of thing. And I wouldn't have the job that I have now if that it didn't exist. And I wouldn't even maybe be in Alberta. So as far as I'm concerned, that's the basis for me. Uh, practicums. What was the program? I started with uh, Youth Canada at work federally, but then it was a provincial uh, job access in Alberta, so I could benefit from it uh, over six months, and six months was uh, um, amazing for the employer also, it was great. We don't have to convince young people from Louisiana to stay, because they all want to do it, as I said not just when it comes to French, but more generally, we want to stay in Louisiana, but there's no opportunity and there's not enough opportunities to speak and work and create in French. I could give you many examples of my friends who live in France or in Acadia or in Quebec because they're attending university because they, they can't practice their profession, their fields in Louisiana in French. So we have to create opportunities. We have to have this economic design. But we think also we want to focus on young people and resources on learning. And what we're doing is, uh, as I said, there's already a population that wants to speak French but doesn't have the resources because their grandparents uh, passed away, they live in a village that's too far away from Alliance Francaise or French schools, but there are the people that might be interested. And we're trying to communicate with them in three ways, through economic models to show that French is useful. I had the opportunity to meet the Prime, the prime Minister of Canada yesterday because I speak French and the cultural aspect, the, the question of the Louisiana culture, it's fundamental to us. And uh, yes, it works. And the third point is the question of uh, fun, energy through social media. That's what we're doing with our web application. It's new, it's interesting, it's dynamic, it's attractive. It's not just it's a lot of work. It's really interesting. You know, you can buy this, you can use our resources and make them interesting and including our dictionary of French Louisiana. To get young people involved, we have to offer opportunities, but also draw their attention to the fact that it's that these very opportunities do exist. When I arrived in Canada, I didn't know there was a university in Moncton. Well, it took a year before I knew that. So when I met people, I was told, when you finish high school, you have to move to Fredericton, Sackville, or Halifax. When I discovered there was a university in Moncton, I was very, very surprised. Why? Neglect the fact that there's a university in Moncton. It's important to draw people's attention to opportunities that are offered here in Moncton. When I looked, when I did some research, there's discussion groups, there's organizations, there's a lot of things happening. And for me, I was uh, when I received the bursary from the city of Moncton, it really helped me. I was well supported in my studies. So there are opportunities. But also you have to know that these opportunities do, in fact, exist. And we have to celebrate the language we have to have some fun. 
and eat together and concerts, events. Young people use the internet most days. So they have to see that French exists on the web and do so more in the future. We have to convince young people that French is cool, right? And yes, it's true because just in Moncton, we can live and study, we can live and study and work and grow in French. It's possible to do so here. Yes, programs, employment programs, opportunities. A scholarship, from what I hear, the scholarship changed your life allowed you to do something that you want to do to study in medicine and stay with your family and in your community. So we shouldn't neglect the importance of such tools, scholarships, to get young people to stay. So we have a few minutes uh, remaining. Are there any questions from all of you? I don't see microphones. No, we probably have all the microphones here. But, you know, if you have any questions for a panelist, yeah. You have to use a microphone for interpretation. I'll invite you to come at the front here, and I'll give you the microphone for simultaneous interpretation. Thank you for this reminder. So are there any questions? Yes, sir. Come and join me in the front. I'm putting you on a spot here, but you can ask a question to the group or to someone in particular, if you so wish. There. Well, I think Roger Siguan. I am the mayor of the city of Hearst, and I'm part of this wonderful family here. And I think it's important, and again, I thank Mr. Labon for having this great initiative. Last year, we had the opportunity to have a young, a young um, intern working in our community. 90% of our population is francophone. She did excellent work for our community. It said we couldn't keep her. But she was a young lady coming from Quebec, and I think Mr. Lebec said, you can go, but you have to come back. <laughs> but this was great for us to have this person come to work in our community. She did excellent work, and we're very grateful. At Hearst, in Hearst, we have the smallest French-speaking University in Ontario, we have to say so because they said in Toronto it's the first university they want by Hearst, is the first French-speaking university in Ontario, as I said. We live in French. We're looking for young people. We have a shortage of young people to work in our community in every field. And I think it's important to try to have some transparency to get these young people and add and enrich our communities. That's what we seek. Uh, so I encourage young people to continue to study. But French is very important for us in Northern Ontario. We never say it often enough. We're francophones. My community is at 90%, but in the region, there's about 65 to 70 percent francophones in the region. I'm talking about northern Ontario. There's some in eastern Ontario. There's some elsewhere in Ontario. But Ontario, with all the issues and problems that we have with our government, that does not support francophone as much. And again, I like to thank Quebec and the people, you know, and here people have the opportunity to meet people from other people who want to work with us and give us tools so that we are even stronger. Even in New Brunswick and Quebec, when they lowered the flag, that was well recognized. Thank you very much. It was more of a comment than a question. Great, thank you. One last question. All right, one last question, and then we'll try to be as brief as possible. Yes, thank you, Anthony. Carole. Hello, Carole Trépetit. I represent a network in Quebec City with the Canadian Pan Mandate, making arts and culture as a fourth lever 
in sustainable development for municipalities. So my question is when it comes to the arts and culture, yes, I mentioned this briefly, events are important, but do you, do you as an individual buy some cultural elements? Is that important? Or linguistically in your development, linguistically, do you, what are the tools? How do you, how do you access cultural elements? I know it's fairly wide, but can you answer this one? Yes, oh yes, for me it's very essential. Before I started learning French on the internet, I looked at anything around France and Canada and French culture, food, locations. I was diving into French culture so that I could learn the language. Like any other Francophone, so yes, I, I learned a great deal around culture and in Moncton. I spent some time with uh, Acadians. I learned about the Acadian culture. I sampled Acadian foods and music. One of my best friends is an Acadian, so all that was essential for me to be able to live in French and learn French. Well, thank you. It already exists in Louisiana, it still exists. That's why we can't just talk about a French legacy in Louisiana. It's not quite specific because there are Francophones now in Louisiana. There are concerts, plays, a lot of music, a lot of musicians of my generation. And that's our goal, to make it more accessible to people at home. But in the end, I think it's very important that it exists and the people, you know, have uh, have coffee houses, events, shows in French. So yes, we're working on those two issues. Just to add, yes, absolutely, when it comes to events, festivals, arts and culture, even for tourism, this is really great. So for us, it has a lot of value. And again, that's where... You know, in Calgary, we have the musicals museum, the Museum of Music in Calgary. So we discover francophone francophone artists outside uh, Quebec or, or from. So it's great that people are exposed to all these artists, and I'm very pleased that we have this in Calgary because people don't necessarily think of it. But yeah, it's really important in uh, development. I think. There's wonderful opportunities when we talk with our young people. We often talk about creating digital content in French because young people, you know, they live also on the web, on social media. It often takes place in the English, in English, in the, but because if we can, there's a lot more created in English and French. So to have opportunities to create digital work in French, that's really important. And everything that is to be, you know, to discover francophone content on the web is important on Netflix, uh, on regardless the platform. There's French content, but it's not what we see right away. So when you search not knowing exactly what you're looking for, it's difficult to discover it. So it's really important, you know, with all the agreements that we have, platforms like Netflix, Teddy Finn Canada, we have to promote this content so young people can see them. All right, so literally I have three seconds left. So I wish to thank our panelists. Thank you very much. You know, if we ask young people, they're often, they're, they're seldom pleased when we say that you have to take over. You know, taking over, you know, it's not really pleasant. Young people have something to contribute today. Young people have the role to play in your municipalities, in your communities today. We have to engage them. And it's false to say that young people are not interested in anything. We have to give them the opportunity to get interested in various topics that will passionate, that they will, 
for which they'll be passionate. So thank you for attending this uh, conference and to listening to the youth. It's really appreciated. I would like to thank also Rendezvous, the network, and the Francophone Center of America. Thank you for including youth in this programming. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. I wish you an excellent lunch and have an excellent day. <laughs>